This week on Oklahoma Horizon. Well, from its earliest days, aviation has played a major role in Oklahoma's economy. Currently, one in 10 Oklahoma jobs is connected to aerospace. Today, we visit the Boeing facilities in Oklahoma City to find out why the company plans on doubling their workforce over the coming year and the work underway to ensure they have a skilled workforce to fill those jobs. That's the way we're going to create jobs because we're going to bring engineering back from offshore, back to America. This is, this is where it starts. Our Andy Barth heads out to the annual Speed Fest competition to see why small unmanned aerial vehicles called UAVs look to be the next big thing in aerospace. Well, we're very proud of our aeronautical engineering area and the uh, unmanned aerial systems that we're, we're, I think, really a national leader in. Our Keela Kellen takes us to a statewide competition that puts the skills of those wanting to work in the trade industries to the test. And we meet a construction team where the sign Minute Work may not be accurate anymore. It's fun. It's hard work, but it is so much fun. And I'll sit down with Harvard professor and Pathways to Prosperity director Bill Simons to talk about education and jobs. The graduates coming out of Metro Tech here are spending about 18 months uh, on average to get their uh, certificate. When they're coming out, they're getting jobs, many of them starting at about $50,000 a year. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. With the opening of a new 320,000 square foot building in Oklahoma City, the Boeing Company is preparing to more than double its workforce in Oklahoma. More than 2,100 jobs are coming to the state, according to the company's CEO, because of Oklahoma's reputation for top-end, affordable engineers. But maintaining a well-skilled workforce is an investment which is where our Lisa Hines picks up our story. That's right, Rob. Across the aerospace industry, companies are in search of high-skilled, well-trained employees, which is why Boeing hosted a group of Oklahoma educators to help give them some insight into the importance of piquing students' interest in aviation at an early age. With a presence in Oklahoma since 1953, engineers at Boeing have been supporting Tinker Air Force Base and the missions they do for our country. And we provide engineering solutions for the sustainment of the aircraft and weapon systems that the Tinker Air Force Base supports. Michael Emmelhaines is the site director at Boeing and says engineering talent is key to their success, but not always easy to find. As the global economy expands, the ability to, to, to have that engineering talent gets to be more and more of a challenge. We're expanding in Oklahoma City. We're, we're actually going to double in size over the next two years. And as we do that, it's going to drive more and more uh, requirements for engineering talent. Uh, certainly, we get uh, a pretty good supply from the, the, the regional universities, uh, OU, OSU, and, uh, and that certainly is a, a huge benefit to what we need. I want to be here another 50 or 100 years, so we need a pipeline of engineering and, and math students to help fill that need as we go forward. So they're helping build their own pipeline. We were honored this year to get to host the, uh, the uh, Education Day portion of the Oklahoma Aerospace Summit, and, and it's, a, it's a very, very uh, important event. It's one where uh, teachers throughout the, the state are invited. They come and they, they sit through some workshops and, and learn more and more about STEM education, the aerospace industry, how we can partner and support them. So it's a great opportunity for them to spend some time uh, with, with leadership in the aerospace community and understand it a little bit better. But it's just a wonderful way also for us to thank them for what they do to help ensure the education of our young people. According to retired Brigadier General Ben Robinson, there's a shortage of engineers in aerospace and it takes a long time to train someone, so we need to start early. 
it's important not just in Oklahoma, but across America. We have got to improve our science, technology, engineering, and math if we want to get from, from where we are right now in 17th in the world in engineering back to the top. Uh, that's the way we're going to create jobs, because we're going to bring engineering back from offshore, back to America. This is, this is where it starts. An engineer starts in middle school, and it's a decade and a half long process, but it starts in middle school. We've got to start making those connections now and firing up and creating that enthusiasm, that creativity, that ingenuity in our middle school students, and they will produce engineers in the future. So this is a, this is a, this is a paying it forward to our future. Do we still see evidence of those impacts today? So how do you get students excited about such a challenging field? Dorinda Reisenhoover is with the Oklahoma NASA Space Grant Consortium. Kids don't realize it, but they're born as scientists. You know, when they're little babies, they're little natural scientists. And somewhere along the way they decide, and it's most, mostly girls, but even some of the boys decide that they may not be so good at science and they don't realize that it's just what they've been doing all their entire life. And so activities like this remind them that anyone can be a scientist and that they are scientists every single day. But before you can teach the student, I have them come up first with how could they make it move with just the rocket? You have to teach the teacher. Well, the biggest thing is, especially right now with a huge push of STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, that they need real-life hands-on activities that they can do with their students that are simple enough and applicable enough back to the classroom and cheap. And the activities that I'm doing with them, which are very consistent with a lot of NASA activities, they are using recycled materials or using very cheap materials. So the teachers can easily implement these in their classroom. And it's a real working model that allows the children to really discover the concept without being told the concept. Kelly Wardlaw is a Stillwater Middle School teacher and says it's hands-on instruction. Anytime you can put something in their hands and get them playing, then they're learning and they don't know it, and they love it. <laughs> Just looking at how much fun these teachers are having, I'd say their students are in for a really fun school year. Oh, they would love it, absolutely. Anytime you give them a chance to work, they'll probably be better with glue sticks than we are. <laughs> They always learn. Every time you give them something to do, they're always learning something. Even after school programs are getting involved. Cedric Curran Moore is the STEM project coordinator for the Oklahoma After School Network and says these activities help connect education to the real world. And it shows not only teachers but students how important science is, math is, and how, you know, it connects to the aerospace industry and other industries. This program has even caught the eye of the director of the National Career Pathways Network, David Bond. This is extremely important. I'm very impressed with what's going on here. The uh, teachers are learning ways to show students how what they're learning in the classroom is used in the real world, and that's just a perfect way to learn. A learning experience for teachers to take back to the classroom and make future engineers. Now, while many of the jobs coming into the state may be filled with Boeing workers from Wichita and the West Coast, Boeing officials know that for the long-term viability of their company, they need to be able to produce homegrown engineering talent. Now, I want to ask you about something General Ben Robinson said. Does it really take 18 years to educate an engineer? You heard right, Rob. STEM classes tend to build upon themselves, and STEM advocates seem to think that to get kids interested in these fields, they need to get to them before they hit high school. Because once they hit high school, they seem to think taking these kind of classes is just way too hard. Hmm, pretty interesting. Good story. Thanks so much, Lisa. You're welcome, Rob. Now, when we return, we'll take a look at why the next big thing in aviation may be very, very small. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Modern American warfare has changed dramatically. In recent years, the Air Force has trained more drone pilots than conventional pilots, and the Pentagon is increasingly relying on drones to fight wars and terrorism overseas. Now, these unmanned aerial vehicles, called UAVs, offer many clear advantages to conventional forces. They're more precise and relatively cheap to operate. 
all done from thousands of miles away with crews safely on the ground. Now, new UAVs are constantly under development, and Oklahoma State University is leading the nation in developing the engineers who will design these craft. Joining me now is our Andy Barth. Well, Rob, students at OSU are giving a whole new meeting to model airplanes. Aerospace engineering students designed and built planes for the Speedfest competition, which is just a stepping stone to an aviation career. These aren't your ordinary model airplanes. They're carefully designed and engineered over the course of 14 weeks. It's been a really busy semester, not much sleep. Andrew Austin is the team leader for OSU's black team and says the Speed Fest is more than a competition. Let's you get a perspective of how things get put together as far as composites. That's kind of where the aircraft industry is going right now. Um, more and more components on airplanes are being built out of uh, composite material, carbon fiber, fiberglass, whatever. And uh, kind of let you know how things go together so whenever you design it, you're not going at it blindly. Once the basic models are done, it's out to the runway to see what happens. We started test flying about uh, the beginning of March. and. Uh, about uh, once a week s since then, on the weekends usually. We'll go out and we'll get to fly about four different times before uh, it gets too dark. The flight days uh, have been kind of uh, to test out our propulsion systems. Um, we haven't really had many structural issues, mostly uh, dialing in the propulsion systems, figuring out which propeller to use, uh, what speed to run at. A semester's worth of work coming down to two minutes, with varying degrees of success. It's uh, basically a vertical takeoff, pylon race competition. Uh, we'll run for two minutes, and uh, then after that, we have to deploy a banner. We're gonna fly around, do the pylon racing, and then uh, after that, we have to do one lap with a banner, and the banner's just gonna, this will get retracted back in flight and the banner will come out and it'll be trailing behind the aircraft. Then we can come in and land. It's uh, see whoever gets the most laps. Altogether, 13 teams competed in the competition with three college teams and 10 high school teams, some doing better than others. And according to Oklahoma State University President Burns Hargis, success or failure is still all a part of the learning experience. It really uh, is a real-world experience of the theory, the theory that uh, our students are learning. It's so much better when you have hands-on uh, hands experience doing what you've just been taught, and that's exactly what this does. And Hargis says he hopes programs like this attracts future cowboys. Well, we're very proud of our aeronautical engineering area and the uh, unmanned aerial systems that we're, we're, I think, really a national leader in. And therefore, it, it certainly highlights the excellence that goes on at this, uh, at this university. And we want to grow that. And so we think great students and great faculty will be attracted to this whole program. And, uh, and our, comp our competitive wins in design, build, and fly, I think, just punctuate that whole emphasis that we have. Taking to the skies while earning an education. Now, the black team took second place overall, but lost to their OSU counterparts, the OSU Orange team. So let's talk job prospects. What type of careers can these young people look forward to? Well, Rob, these students are going to be traveling nationwide for a variety of different careers. Some students will be working for a national headquarters for airlines, while other students are going to be going into the U.S. Air Force. But either way, they're going to be in high demand for their skills. All right. Certainly sounds like an exciting job to have. Thanks so much, Andy. You're welcome, Rob. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, preparing for the jobs of the future. What do you need to succeed in the workforce of uh, today? But first, women at work. We'll go to a construction site and you may see a sign that says men at work, but not at the one our Keela Kellen just returned from. 
Each year, students from across the state gather at the Skills USA competition. It's an event that allows students studying various trades to compete for scholarships and prizes. And we caught up with one team bent on breaking stereotypes. Using power tools and getting your hands dirty has always been viewed as a man's job. But for these four girls from Shawnee, Oklahoma, construction is a career that they are building on. It is tough. I mean, it's not easy. And, you know, you do have those men that do like to pick on you. But that hasn't stopped this all-female team from Gordon Cooper Technology Center. Construction industry is dying for females. Because of minority quotas and uh, gender quotas, a lot of construction companies would love to have some management that had females. Jody Island is an instructor at Gordon Cooper Technology Center, and he has managed this team of girls who have become the first all-girls construction team to make it to the state level in the Skills USA competition. The only issue is they're short. And so they have to overcome those barriers, just like we have to overcome barriers in any part of our life. Not only are these girls learning skills in construction, but they are also building their futures. When you get out of this program, you can either go straight to work as a carpenter. Of course, you won't be higher up on the food chain in the work world, but it's still good money. Or you can go to a college to be a construction manager where you are the top guy on the project telling everyone what to do. Leah Holloway is a member on this all-girls team and plans to attend college to become a psychologist, but pay her way through college working construction. We can do this. We might be a foot shorter than everyone else, but we can still do it. <laughs> Being the only female team in an environment full of men attracts some attention. It can be intimidating at times, you know, but you know, it's, it's fun, you know, it really is. If a guy can do it, I can do it. And I'm going to show that guy that I can do it. Like all the teams competing in the Skills USA competition, these girls can do it all. I'm enrolled in the electrical program at Gordon Cooper and electrician trained as a carpenter. And so I can do both now and it's a real, you know, it's a life experience. Yeah, just make it flat against the board. I'm actually the, a carpenter, cross-trained in plumbing, so um, I'm a framer, and, uh, and then I do all the plumbing work, which I like plumbing a lot better. While hammering, drilling, and sawing may be their passion, it isn't necessarily the only career objective for these young students. All four of these kids are going to college. Some of them are going into construction management. One of them's going into uh, child psychology. The other one's gonna be a vet. They're all looking for opportunities to expand their life, as well as, uh, you know, hopefully a little exposure will help them with some college funding. It's fun. It's hard work, but it is so much fun. Building their way to success in an industry that can no longer say, men at work. And the ladies from Gordon Cooper Technology Center finished second in their TeamWorks competition. Oklahoma Horizon is now portable. Just subscribe to our weekly podcast. Visit iTunes.com where you can download our show for your listening or viewing convenience. Well, over the next 10 years, the U.S. economy will create roughly 20 million new jobs. But here's the catch. Of those new jobs, six out of 10 will require a college degree or an occupational certification. And not just any old sheepskin. These are jobs that require specific skills, which is why an effort is underway in schools across our country to closer match education with jobs. Earlier this spring, I had the opportunity to sit down with the director of Harvard Business School's Pathways to Prosperity Project, Bill Simons, to talk about education for the jobs of the future. Mr. Simons, I think it's probably a widely held conventional wisdom that we need more college graduates in this country. In fact, President Obama has mentioned that, our governor has her own initiative to, to do that. Yet you say in your report, Pathways to Prosperity, that may not be the right focus. Why is that? Well, I think we have to define what we mean by college. So a lot of Americans think in order to succeed in 2012, you need to go to a four-year college. 
whether that's Oklahoma State, University of Oklahoma, or some other school. What we're saying is for most jobs, you actually don't need a four-year college degree. At the same time, many kids are going to a four-year college uh, because they think they need that degree, and they're dropping out before they get the degree. So they end up with a lot of debt. Student debt this year is going to equal uh, or exceed a trillion dollars. Uh, students now have more debt than Americans have uh, money on their credit card, which is pretty incredible if you know anything about the amount of money that the average person puts on their credit card. So they're acquiring a lot of debt. Many of them are not getting the degree. And many of those degrees are not necessary for the good jobs um, that we have in the economy. And we also have a fairly high unemployment in the 20-somethings. Is that possibly a symptom of whether they're not getting the degree or maybe they're, they're getting the wrong degree? I think it is a uh, symptom of the growing disconnect between education on the one hand and the workforce on the other. What do you need to succeed in the workforce of uh, today? So, so how does our nation get on this pathway to prosperity? We think uh, it requires taking a more realistic approach to education. We think we've gone way too far down the road of academic elitism. Uh, it sounds funny from a guy who's uh, from Harvard, but we think there's been too much emphasis on strictly academic success, not enough emphasis on the real world practical skills you need. So one good illustration of that is career counseling. Um, talking to students about what they want to do when they grow up in a, in a very realistic sense. Uh, students know that we have doctors and lawyers, obviously. Many of them know about CSI because of, uh, there's so many programs now about CSIs. They don't know about a lot of the jobs in our economy, though, and uh, so they're not aware of all the options. So career counseling is a good starting point. That's not a radical proposal, that's really common sense. But what's amazing is that many of our high school students get almost nothing in the way of real career counseling. How early should this counseling start? Well, you can start talking to students about what they want to do at a fairly young age. I think by the time they get to middle school, that would be a great time to start talking more seriously about what their options are and connect that to also to how much money you can make in the different fields, what kind of skills you need to succeed in those fields, uh, what are you going to be doing all day, uh, is that really something that you're interested in. And we think that uh, going from there, it's good to ask students to start developing a life plan. Um, you know, what are they aiming to do? What kind of courses do they need to get there to do that? Now, you can change your mind. We're not talking about tracking students into anything. This, these are decisions that they would make along with their parents, but they're starting to think about it. That's the key point. What about those people that would argue that the experience of going to the university, of being in college, is just as important as the education that you would receive? Well, uh, I think there's lots of different experiences you can have in life. Um, you know, for many students, it, it turns out to be fairly difficult. You know, they're acquiring a lot of debt, uh, et cetera, and they're, in many cases, not doing well in the class if they don't know why they're there. Uh, I'm not saying that a four-year college uh, is bad for everyone. Obviously, it's a great option for some students, but we've oversold it as the only answer, the only pathway. What we're suggesting is there should be multiple pathways to success. For some students, a four-year college is really the best option. But for other students, they'd be a lot uh, better off going to a place like Metro Tech. And speaking of Metro Tech, we're sitting here inside this, this airplane hangar where there is a lot of skills-based learning. Is right. that what you're talking about, what we should focus on? Right. Many of the best jobs in the U.S. Um, are what we call middle skills jobs. They require very advanced technical skills. They do not require a four-year college degree. The graduates coming out of Metro Tech here are spending about 18 months uh, on average to get their uh, certificate. When they're coming out, they're getting jobs, many of them starting at about $50,000 a year. With overtime, many of them are making a lot more than that. Now here in Oklahoma, the average wage is only $28,000 a year. So you can see that just by spending 18 months at Metro Tech, you're already coming out making perhaps twice as much as what the average worker does in Oklahoma. I'd say that's a pretty good return on the investment. And by the way, you can get all of this education for less than $9,000. Compare that to the uh, tuition at a four-year college, and, and you'll see this is a really great deal. Now I have much, much more with Mr. Simons, including some very good advice for not only students, but parents and teachers. And it's all streaming on our website. Just go to OKHorizon.com and click on this week's Value Added. If you're interested in Oklahoma culture, you can keep up with us throughout the week on the Red Dirt Chronicles blog. Look for the On the Horizon postings on Tuesdays and Fridays and tell us what you think. When Will Rogers talked, people listened. 
Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we'll see how the rope twirling, plain talking Cherokee cowboy became one of the most powerful political voices in America. People loved him. People wanted to be like him. People quoted him. Uh, they emulated him, and he was the real deal. He didn't let him down. And we'll visit the Will Rogers Museum on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that's going to wrap us up for today, but you can see more of any of our stories on our website at okhorizon.com. You can watch us on the go with our weekly podcast on iTunes. Follow us throughout the week on Twitter at OK Horizon TV or just become a Horizon fan on Facebook. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon. <laughs>